Hello, welcome again to Sport on Lots with me, Rob Harris from Sky News, Tarek Panja from the New York Times and Martin Ziegler from the Times. And Martin, we start off with a media call you were on with the FIFA referee in chief, Pierluigi Colina. How was it? It doesn't suffer fools gladly. Um, you know, shoots from the hip, isn't he? And uh, no, but it was really interesting. So, I mean, his, his big thing has been um, getting this additional time. So we saw in the World Cup in Qatar, matches were, you know, they had up to, you know, 14 minutes of, of stoppage time. Um, and this is something which is being rolled out across the world now because the IFAB, the International Affairs Board, has agreed to follow suit. He, he gave an interesting briefing and he just said, he sort of referred to the, the Liverpool-Manchester United 7-0 game and said, look, there's only three minutes of stoppage time at the end of the second half. Um, there'd be, there were six goals, ten substitutions, you know, whatever other injuries, um, time wasting, or, or um, VAR decisions is on top of that. So, you know, how can you only have three minutes? And he just said, you know, probably the, the referee thought he was showing common sense in in, in the scoreline being so high and in not adding on any more. But actually, referencing that that could actually be a, a, an issue if it comes to goal difference at the end of the season. And he also talked about this, you know, should FIFA look at something called the mercy rule, which they, they use in baseball, where if, uh, you know, at, at the end of six innings, if in a nine minute innings match, if a, if a team is 10 points ahead, then you, you don't play on anymore. And it's, but, you know, that would have to be introduced into the laws of the game that, you know, if a team is winning by X number of goals, after 90 minutes, does it, does a referee then just end it straight away? But, um but yeah, it's an intriguing, it's an intriguing idea. If you're the player chasing goal records, you might not like that. Or if it comes down to goal difference, even if there is such thing as goal difference in football, then you should be able to rack up as many goals as possible. Yeah, it'll probably work um, in a cup tie, right? Um, if you're three three nil up in a one of those one off games, you you go. And then uh, Pier Luigi's also been talking about um, fans, whether they you know they pay to watch football, not to just sit and watch, you know. People time wasting, etc. He he had some other examples, didn't he? He said there was a game in the Premier League. Uh, the the in play time was about what not, not much more than forty three minutes, uh, and, and that's that's one of the things they're trying to get to this sixty minute time clock. Yeah, so that the, the effective playing time is that, that they're trying to aim for around sixty minutes, which they they were there and thereabouts actually in the World Cup. Um, but it's amazing how it, it, it sort of differs across the leagues. I mean, the Champions League actually has is one of the highest effective playing times, but one of the, not particularly high amount of stoppage time. It's just the, the style of football, I think. Whereas um, other leagues, it, it's you know, it, it down below fifty, um, which it, you can see for the you know the paying public is is not particularly good. Um, and this has been a bit of a, you know, a campaign of Kalina's. I suppose one of the other big football results with big consequences beyond the pitch this week was actually Paris Saint-Germain going out of the Champions League. It's all the Qatar project. They're 12 years into it at PSG. Keep on going out in the round of 16. Not going to discuss the tactical side of it, but as an institution, as a club, all that spending, all the big names they're bringing in, some commentary around even why they're not using as many homegrown players. Could they be tapping into that market a lot more to be more connected to Paris? But... All this time in, where are Qatar heading with PSG? Well, I suppose it's uh, you know that that's been their, their their ultimate aim, and I guess you could say the same for Manchester City. Um, and that has been their target; has always proved elusive. And I think you know for for the state-owned clubs, you know they that is something that 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 is the sort of the aim of the project, I guess, isn't it? City. It's kind of been quite consistent in in its performances, though the the Paris Saint Germain project has seemed just a bit wilder and freewheeling in terms of um, managerial changes after each Champions League failure. Let's see if this this chap Gaultier is there next summer. The sporting director changes, spending huge amounts on whoever the um, world's best players are and trying to fit them in into uh, an eleven player team. It just seems a bit wilder, and that might explain why, you know, when it comes to these crunch matches, they seem to fall short. City, perhaps different reasons. 
And City do play an exciting league, the Premier League, with that global appeal. For PSG, it's all about the Champions League because Ligue 1, what sort of status does that really have globally? It doesn't have the glamour. I mean, the, the, the idea is, you know, if you sign Messi, re-sign Mbappe, get Neymar, um, th- then I think it, it, some people might think, oh, well, job done in terms of the profile of the club internationally and globally. Um, but yeah, I think it, 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 that's not so e- it's not so easy to translate that into into winning the most important. Well, club maybe um, they might want to buy another really massive team in the world and see if they could win a, a Champions League with another team, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, PSG are going to that battle with the Paris Mayor as well over building a new stadium. The part of the France certainly not big enough for them, perhaps, and they are facing that resistance as well. So they're not exactly being having their path smoother. No, that's an interesting uh, issue. That about what's going to happen with there. But I mean, there's. I think there was another report in French media this week that they would they, they'd look at the Stade de France. Um, the other idea is mo- actually moving outside the Paris boundaries to where their their new training centre is going to be, and just building a completely new stadium um, there. Which I imagine, with all the Qatari money, they could do um, without, without even sort of noticing it. But um, it's uh, so yeah. That's that, that. I think if you're in Paris, that's that's a big issue, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. So something that's connected to that. Of course, since uh, 2009 in the Champions League and the other way for competitions, clubs have to name eight homegrown players of any nationality in their squads for the competitions. But now, a ruling from the Advocate General of the European Court of Justice saying that actually these homegrown player rules might be partially incompatible with the EU's freedom of movement laws. So. What is this ruling all about, and is it anything going to change? It's basically saying it's it's discriminatory uh, potentially um, that you that you to other to other EU countries that players um, can can be said to be homegrown um, if if they've spent three years in, in, in a particular um, league uh, during their development years. Um, and that actually, in order to make it make it fairer cl- and to promote clubs developing players, they should say they, that it can only be seen seen as homegrown if you actually um, come through that club's academy. So you can't come through another club's academy. I mean, it, it, it's quite sort of technical and legalistic, but what it effectively means is that. Um, it's going to be sort of more difficult, isn't it? I think for a, a club to claim homegrown players, they're going to have to have more from the academy, and th- that's going to cause. They're going to say, "Well, that's you know that that's unfair." And I think there'll be pressure on UEFA to sort of ease some of those restrictions. And that's separate to the pressures, the new pressures on um, English teams now in light of Brexit, isn't it? Uh, that the fact is, they in the past. When Britain was part of the European Union, you could sign a 16-year-old player from from many of the um, EU states. Uh, Post Brexit, those players have to be over 18 and um, have to have a certain standard as well. Uh, so th- these two things together, it, there is a sounds like there's a change of landscape coming up. More broadly, yeah. So it's interesting how you look at the, how the Premier League handles this because I mean the FA has its own um, agreement with the Premier League about numbers of homegrown players, and you know would they follow the, the um, European clubs? They don't have to now um, because of Brexit, but would they follow the European clubs um, and in reducing the number of homegrown players, or would, would they keep it? Or would they keep their definitions? And I'm sure this will tie in as well with. The rules on work permits, which they're they're going through at the moment. Well, away from players on the move to players slowing down, and FIFA Pro have issued their latest report on the workload players are facing, particularly after the last year with the World Cup jammed into the middle of this season and all the issues in terms of the demands put on players. What did the FIFA Pro survey find? So I think they're about they, they surveyed every player. They got about eight hundred and thirty-one players. They got sixty-four responses. I suppose it's a it's fair it's a fair reflection maybe. Um, 
interestingly, I thought the most interesting thing for me that came out of it is that they don't like a Winter World Cup. I think only 89% um, wouldn't want to play in another Winter World Cup. So, the, I mean, I think that's a bit, a bit of an issue. A November, December, they've opposed to a November, December World Cup in the middle of the European season, 89%. And obviously that's a big issue if Saudi Arabia looked like they're poised to bid for 2030 or 2034 World Cup. They'd have to play it in November, December. And we've got Jonas Beer Hoffman, the FIFA General Secretary, saying that they would need you'd need to have a two month, two and a half month break in order to do it properly to get the recovery and preparation times in. Um is that feasible? Is it is it about the winter though, or is it about the um the mid season break? Because this this seems to be an issue that this tournament had to be squeezed in in such a short time frame. Let's go back a bit. The the last league games in Europe uh, were six days before the first World Cup game, and that was kind of insane. And then the players, when they returned, were, were playing within within a similar amount of time, if, if not less. Um, Only well, those who time... reached the final. I mean, um, Serie A was still on a break, wasn't it, until start of January and the Bundesliga as well? They, they have a winter break, though, baked in, regardless of World Cups, Rob. Um, th- th- this issue is about this 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 timing. So the broader point is what's happening now with, with FIFA and its calendar debate, because the plan from Arsene Wenger and everyone else is to design this, this global calendar that you can have two potential periods when a World Cup can be played. The problem is no one is anywhere close to agreeing this calendar. So as it stands, there can't be a Winter World Cup in any other way than we've we've just seen, which is the one that FIFA Pro and the players have have complained about. Do I, you say like playing six days after the end of the domestic league season is insane. I don't think it is. What's With that level of intensity that? of a football tournament, a World Cup. Well, they play, is it is it is is that any more intense than playing in the Premier League? Um, I don't think it is. Well, you just, you fact, just read the th- report. You've just read the report from FIFA, the players' union, who said it was. So may, I'm no expert. Well, no, maybe, and no, no, maybe, no, maybe, maybe, maybe it isn't. <laughs> I well, I, 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 I put it. To, I actually put it to FIFA. I thought, you know, these we've seen. You know, there's lots of research saying actually players' careers are getting are getting longer. So um, we should have more tournaments then, more games. Well, I, I'm not saying we should have more, but I, I, I don't necessarily think it's an issue starting a World Cup a week after. In, I can see it at the end of a long season that you, so you might need to have a bit you, more. So from your point of view, it might be even be better then that you're having it in the middle of the season so it's not at the end of a long season. Yeah, potentially. Yeah. Oh, by the way, we also have a 48-team World Cup as well coming up now. It's not... Yeah, be. that's going to... Yeah, no, that is a different issue altogether. <laughs> I mean... Um, but the, the, what about the calendar debate, Rob? When when's that going to be sorted out? Um, any idea? Well, there's a sort of urgency, isn't there? We've got the 2024, isn't it? That's pressing for the calendar, men's and women's. And that, no sign of no sign of this happening. There is talk that they might be a um, because they can't get to to an, an answer. Where maybe they extend the current arrangements for another two years to give them another two years to kind of argue and bicker and maybe get to. A point two years down the road. Maybe they'll keep on postponing it for years and years and years, and every two years, oh, we'll do it for another two years, and we'll still be in the same situation now in twenty years' time. Well, as we talk about that twenty twenty two World Cup and the dates, which it did have many ramifications, particularly ending up in the middle of the NFL season, which had an impact on TV rights in the United States, uh, which were gained by Fox, but. A court case has been going through in the US, which has now reached its conclusion about just how Fox secured its extension for the World Cup rights on FIFA as effective what compensation for the switch in 2022. Yeah, there was a, a verdict in the, the second FIFA trial. It's amazing, you know, we're 2023 and this these arrests happened way back in 2015. We finally had a, a second trial involving, I guess, people that no one had heard of, these... these um, television executives and TV companies, uh, full play. And then there was a subsidiary of, of a company that we would have heard of was um, Fox Corporation, which is 
what it was then called, um, the Rupert Murdoch owned television company. Um, and there have been uh, guilty verdicts in the case of uh, at least one of the executives and a company called Full Play in Argentina. And that involved bribing and corrupting these football officials from South America and from, from Central America and North America in exchange for television rights. And, you know, a lot of this, it kind of goes over everyone's heads. But the most interesting point was um, in the testimony that led to these convictions from this former Fox, of this former Fox executive, is that they managed to get insider information from Julio Grondona, who would have been convicted of of these crimes had he not died. Um, That allowed according to the, the the evidence and the witnesses, Fox to get the 2022 World Cup rights in Qatar. And then, let's not forget, when the tournament moved to, to winter, Fox managed to almost threaten FIFA with legal action to get the 2026 World Cup rights at a massive discount, which looks even cheaper now because the World Cup is going to be held in, in the United States of America, um, mainly, and, and Canada and Mexico. It must have been, you know, hundreds of millions down for FIFA as a result of that deal. Julio Grondona, um, the head of the Argentinian FA for a long time. Um, I, I remember when he he was head of FIFA's finance committee. So he basically held the purse strings. And speaking to a couple of people in, in the organisation at the time, so I think we're talking about 2011, they, they reckoned he was the biggest crook out of anybody in, in, in football. All that relating to the era of the Sepp Blatter and Jerome Valk FIFA that ended in 2015 when they toppled from power and just the latest case relating to that period. There have, though, been investigations into the current FIFA and the president, Gianni Infantino. One strand of the investigations that has come to an end, the Swiss Attorney General FIFA say has ended the investigation into Gianni Infantino's use of a private flight from Suriname to Switzerland in 2017. Now, there's a lot of tension often on Gianni Infantino's use of private jets, but perhaps this seems like a a route and a journey where one might not seem completely unjustifiable. I don't, I don't quite understand why it would be a sort of against the law anyway. Um, I think there's, you know, you can certainly query why you're not taking a sort of commercial airline, and which, which do fly to Suriname, by the way. Um, but I mean that's that's a different debate to say there's anything sort of illegal about it. That all seemed to me sort of strange and part of this sort of um, unusual investigation going on by the one of the, uh, the former Swiss prosecutors. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, it also feeds maybe some of the sense from from Infantino and some of the people close to him that some of this is vindictive. Um, in in that sense, there might be. Potentially an ethics breach of FIFA's regulations, maybe, who knows? And I think it's been investigated and, uh, you know, we we can have a whole different conversation about the efficacy of FIFA's ethics panel and all the rest of it. But again, I I don't see what what this particular issue has got to do with the the Swiss prosecutors. Of course, that, that longer investigation, that's still running and seems to have a no sign of any conclusion is is the, is the one about those meetings with the with the attorney general in switzerland that led to the ousting of the attorney general but but that that that's still going on um this this flight from suriname is interesting as well because one of the issues was the 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 explanation because infantino said um he had to fly back to a meeting with alexander Sheferin the UA for president, but at the time uh, of that meeting, Sheffrin wasn't in Switzerland. He was in Armenia for for a meeting with the with the federation there. Um, but again, it just seems so many years, and, and you think for what 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 has this got to do with the Swiss authorities? Well, more pressing matters perhaps for FIFA, and what to do about their visit Saudi sponsorship of the Women's World Cup. Criticism from Australia and New Zealand that renewed in the last week about them calling for the government agency to no longer sponsor their tournament this summer.
But how did FIFA get out of it? That's the big thing. I mean, certainly I was hearing at the start of the week that they will no longer sponsor the Women's World Cup. Will there be another Saudi sponsor potentially instead? One that's less obvious tourism agency causing a lot of consternation with the women's players. The fact there isn't full equality for women in Saudi Arabia. They have anti-LGBT laws as well. But as it stands, FIFA haven't said anything because technically they've never announced this sponsorship, just like they never actually announced for the Men's World Cup either. It just suddenly appeared on backdrops. But why do you have to, why do you have to backdoor into a sponsorship? That already is an alarm bell that you, you're kind of so nervous about something, something like a sponsorship, the whole point of which is visibility that you don't announce it, already maybe suggests you might have your own reservations about it. It's a weird one, isn't it? The Saudis, I know, are really are really pissed off about how this has developed. They were um, very much wanting to focus this on the, on, on the Women's World Cup, visit Saudi. Um, I think there's a sort of surprise. <laughs> they were surprised anyone to learn that the Australian New Zealand FAs hadn't been told about it. Um, but it just leaves FIFA in a catch-22 because we know, we have talked about it loads of times on this pod, how important Saudi Arabia is to FIFA. Um, you know, they, apart from sponsorship deals, they've got the Club World Cup come out there. It's sort of the very, very sort of, they, you know, they, they were the national association who put the idea of, of a biennial World Cup on the table for, at, at, for, 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 at the FIFA Congress. So, yes, uh, how do they get out? It's a catch-22, somebody uh, who uh, involved in the conversations told me that FIFA, they don't, they, they don't want to annoy the Saudis. But on the other hand, they've got the situation where the host nation is saying it's unacceptable. And they don't want another Saudi entity either. Well, what a situation to find yourselves in. Again, it just speaks to maybe decision-making there at the top. I mean, a lot of this is inevitable and also the venue of the world cup in australia new zealand how, how did you not see any of this coming also the next world cup is in is in the the men's world cup is in the united states canada and mexico with the us one of the biggest markets in the world fifa is not going to be short of cash uh fifa is already full uh, its coffers are bulging we had that um uh, financial report recently that says how much they have in reserves why, why do they need Several it's billion desperate. in reserves, and they're projecting over 11 billion in revenue yeah. in a four-year cycle for yeah. the 2026 Men's World Cup. Fine, big numbers, but why why does it need to be so wedded to Saudi Arabia in light of all of that? But Martin mentioned that, that this Club World Cup. I'm sure you, you you have lots of places to have the Club World Cup. This 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 kind of real proximity is causing problems that don't need to be there. Away from the world of football, that ongoing thorny challenge for sports about what to do about Russians and Belarusian athletes in terms of their participation in sports. And it's coming to a head in athletics, isn't it? World Athletics preparing to meet to take their decision on Russia, particularly over the doping scandal, because they are the ones who punished them the harshest in many ways, haven't they? Yeah, the, the the long ban on Russians as a part of the doping scandal looks like it's going to be lifted in two weeks' time. Um, they, they've had a sort of independent commission looking at this. And the recommendation, from what I understand, is that the, the, the doping ban is finally lifted. Immediately afterwards, the, the, the World Athletic Council is then going to vote on whether to maintain the ban on Russian and Belarusians imposed as a result of the Ukraine war. Now, we know, you know the IOC and other sports are, are trying to allow them to compete as neutrals. I think this is on a knife edge. Um, there are The council is sort of very delicately, delicately balanced, I think, with and it's going to be very close as to which way this that, goes. That uh, athletics ban dates back to about 2016, doesn't it, Martin? This was the commission that was led by the Norwegian Rune Andersen, I think. And I think of all the sports federations, the, the World Athletics has been the one that has held the firmest line, um, not willing to be moved until everything is clear and whether they can be satisfied that whatever athletes Russia are sending are going to be free of that doping legacy. Uh, it was very frustrating for the Russians, but but it has 
been a process that's been quite transparent um, from from World Athletics, and that compares, I think, quite favourably with, with with stuff that's happened um, elsewhere, particularly with the IOC. Well, that about brings an end to this week's episode of Sports Unlocked. You can message us at Sport Unlocked on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. If you hit subscribe, it lands in your feed automatically. Goodbye for now.